We have learned this morning from Mark already a little bit about the uh, history of the development of uh, the health promoting university idea in um, in Europe, and uh, so the first uh, university that started with such an approach was the U University of um, Lancaster. But uh, already in the in the same year, in 1995. Uh, Five universities came together in Germany, and I was at that time uh, working at the University of Bielefeld, so uh, that was one of the universities. And so we came together all, uh, already then to form a network, and we were so fortunate in that, um, at that time uh, that there was a governmental body uh, in one of the federal states of Germany who, who took over the role of coordinating the network because I think that is one of the essential uh, elements of networking is that there is sustainable funding at least for a person, a position uh, who is um, who is giving a structure and is leading the processes of the network. Um, so this um, the network has grown since then to now more than 100 universities being a uh, member of the network and, uh, and very many individuals uh, who are contributing with activities and programs. Um, I have now taken a position in uh, Denmark. I could also speak about uh, Denmark, but there is no formal network existing. There are networks in the UK, as we have learned this morning, and uh, there is just a recent initiative in Lithuania. Uh, there is also a Spanish network um, existing. Um, but I could speak a little more in depth about the German network of health promoting universities because Later, I conducted some more formal um, network evaluation research about the structures, processes, and also the outcomes of the networking activities. Because the question is, does networking actually um, provide a, um, a, an added value to the activities in the single universities? And that was the question for, for this research. And uh, we could we uh, used the network uh, evaluation framework from uh, Ursula Breskamp Stone uh, to apply it to this network, and and we could clearly see that uh, the the fundamental networking principles were were realized in terms of a non-hierarchical structure in the network, and uh, a common a common goal, common concerns. Um, and also that the structures and processes were, yeah, the, the processes were structured according to achieving this uh, common goal. Uh, we also conducted some more quantitative research uh, where we asked the members about their uh, current activities in the universities and the outcomes of the networking activities. Um, and it became clear that, uh, that about one third of the universities who are part of this network uh, have um, the have health in the agenda in the guiding principles of the uh, institution, which again is also a, a, a very uh, essential for um, for a settings-based approach. Uh, and about 20% of the universities have. Um, implemented the 10 guiding principles. Mark has briefly mentioned them this morning as well, that the German network uh, has developed uh, quality criteria, 10 criteria. Uh, they have just recently uh, conducted an award uh, among members where um, universities could submit um, uh, projects uh, based on these 10 principles. Um, so, and, and the members in this uh, in this study, they also um, mentioned or perceived uh, certain health gains among staff of the universities, but also among students. A bit more among staff because most of the universities in uh, Germany were more focusing on uh, health development among staff than among students. That was one of the concerns that. I concluded from this research that participation of students would be even more um, essential. 
But there are quite recent developments of integrating students also more into the networking activities uh, in terms of students conducting their own student research on uh, health themes and issues. So, uh, in conclusion, I regard uh, the German network uh, really as a success story and not only in terms of enlarging the, and growing uh, the network, um, but, um, but also because it was possible to receive uh, sustainable funding, that was, I think, one of the uh, essential elements, but also that the, that the ne network more and more concentrated itself on long-term goals, and such long-term goals as integrating the health-promoting university idea um, into the governmental scheme of, um, of prevention and health promotion with a settings approach that were, was uh, developing, uh, but it needs certain advocacy to connect uh, and to, to get uh, health promoting universities into uh, an agenda of healthy settings. And just based, based on that experience, uh, what kind of incentive do you think that the government agency had to, to supply this kind of resourcing to the, such networks? Uh, that is an interesting question because it was actually a, a, a governmental body that was only responsible for one federal state, although the network uh, is um, a national network. Uh, so um, I think the incentive was the visibility of this particular uh, agency beyond maybe the borders of this uh, federal state. and maybe also the opportunity uh, to reserve a certain amount of, of money for this activity. But uh, there, w there wasn't really a, a visible incentive. Yeah. Mm. Fascinating. And what role do you think um, this, this type of networking uh, plays in increasing healthy settings on campuses? Oh, it def definitely uh, plays a, a big role because it, it makes the approach more visible for universities because uh, universities are nowadays also competing with each other in terms of, uh, of giving themselves uh, uh, also a specific focus. And, um, and being part of a network uh, also enables universities to, to have a certain quality, to receive a certain quality label. So, uh, and that again is also fostering uh, the, the development of the idea. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, we'll just pass the microphone to Lancelot. Um, Lancelot comes from the Asia Pacific network and will be sharing with us a few, a few experiences from that network. Um, what is the current state of the Health Needs University movement in the Asia-Pacific region? Well, I guess before I begin, um, is anyone here from Asia-Pacific? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> we have me and you, <laughs> the two of us. Oh, and one more, three. Yeah, it's 50 more percent. So, well, well that, that pretty much explains the current stage of the Asia-Pacific network. <laughs> <laughs> But, but <laughs> that's, that's actually the, the truth and nothing but the truth. Well, since 2007, we had the first Asia-Pacific uh, conference on Healthy University. That was held in Hong Kong. And it, we invited uh, uh, institutions from 10 different countries, uh, 35 different institutions, to come into Hong Kong, we even had the regional director of the WHO Western Pacific Office come to officiate our ceremony. And at the end, we, had, uh, we all signed a joint declaration and said, okay, we are going to form a network. And then, but then, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> but some, somehow, uh, how, how did that happen? Well, I guess a lot, a lot of the reason is that um, the, the, the view of how health promotion works in the Asia-Pacific regions uh, is quite simplistic. Now, uh, th those of us who are here will know that uh, we need to go beyond simply netting, letting people know about how important health is and then, and then they will do it. Well, we know that we need to do more. But then 
after looking at the activity that has been going on since the conference, well, we we are still staying at the point where we what we do is we print posters, we uh, organize health talks, we send out mass emails, and we do game booths. That's the things that has been going on in various universities uh, during my review. Uh, I will review what what they have been done, and that, that's all. That, that's to it. Uh, they, they don't have, and uh, we don't. We all don't have any long-term development plan for our health promotion works. As Mark has already uh, said this morning, uh, we are very projectish. <laughs> all our uh, all our activities are done in isolation. They are uh, they, and in this next kind of simplistic way, what kind of network do we need? to uh, tell people how to design generic posters, or send out mass emails, <laughs> or design a really exciting game booth where people can throw a ball and hit some target to learn about some health, health issues. And then we definitely do, do not need a network to tell us how to invite a speaker to speak about some health issues. So I go back to Christian's points about what's the added value of having a network in the Asia-Pacific region. We just don't, don't see that value. Where's that value to us as, as institutions? We all uh, set up in our own way because uh, in contrast to the German network, we, when we're talking about Asia-Pacific, then we are talking about a huge region with many different countries and each country should have their own diverse uh, set of institutions. How do we get everyone together in a network with a single agenda to promote health? It is much harder than, than simply sharing. Uh, sharing is good. But what do we share? At least we could start with sharing, I guess. We share. What, what do we share? What is the added value in it? What do you want to share with us if, if we're in a network? Well, I guess we share the best practices that, that have worked somewhere. That would be a great start. Uh, but the current best practice uh, are printing posters and, and <laughs> doing help talks. So that's a, that's a tell. That doesn't add any value to, to the region to the, uh, with the network. So what else can we do? We share our failure stories. Well, I, I, I'd like to hear, uh, hear more about failure stories because we learn from our mistakes. And then that's something that we don't hear from, from journals well, because we all know that they don't like failure stories. So what do we do? What can we do? Now I guess we, start, we can start somewhere from the bottom. Again, this top-down approach has shown that, okay, we, 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 we are not going anywhere with the top-down approach. Can we start from the bottom up? Now, it, at my university, at least, we are we trying to encourage students and staff to be very innovative, to be very entrepreneurial, right? to try to start business, whatever. And we, but we never ask them about how to promote health. And they should know better. They should know what is most valuable to them. They should know what they need. And they should know the experience with receiving all those emails, posters, and health talks, or, or the lack of or lack of experience, because I guess most most of us would, I guess, walk past those posters and pretend we don't see them. We will just ignore the health talks because uh, we, we are not really interested in the topic that are being uh, yeah, that are in, in the discussion, and and we simply hate mass emails. We don't read any of them, <laughs> so but we're still doing them. So, Lancelot, what, what would turn this situation around in your view? Well, we need to ask more the opinions of the staff and students who are the major stakeholders in, in, in the universities, what they need, what they value. Well, we know that health is important and, and we assume that everybody values health. But at the moment when people decide what they have to do, do they really value their health as much as other things? For students, well, they will worry about the GPA more than, than their health, most obviously. They will, well, they will skip exercising to study. They will eat their snack while they're studying. They won't sleep when, when the final exam comes. So how can we 
just tell them, okay, health is important to you. Uh, you, should be, you should do more things to be healthy. That won't work. We need to find that value that are really important for the students and for the staffs. Uh, we, we don't get promoted for being healthy. <laughs> so that would be a start, I guess. <laughs> Wouldn't, be, wouldn't that be great? You know, we, we go exercise and we get promoted instead of writing papers. <laughs> so so there's, a, there's a culture that needs to be shaped, it sounds like. In yeah, terms that's of, a culture. Yeah. And, and the incentive that drive our behaviors needs to be looked at and then see how we can align the incentive with people's needs and then I guess that's the way to go for us. Fabulous. All right. Well, here from Alafia Samuels. Um, who in 2010 was um, instrumental in uh, being part of a Healthy Campus initiative on, on her university campus in Barbados. And um, what was interesting about this particular initiative is that it was the administration of the university that commissioned a survey of risk factors for chronic disease among staff in their institutions. And so what I would like to hear from Alapia is um, the role that that research played in supporting ongoing health promotion initiatives at UWI. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, first, I want to talk a little bit about the context within, that within which the request from the administration came. Um, the Caribbean, the English-speaking Caribbean, um, has the worst epidemic of chronic diseases in the region of the Americas. For example, in Trinidad, the mortality from diabetes is 600% higher than it is in Canada. So the heads of government in CARICOM in 2007 met um, to talk about non-communicable diseases and issued the Port of Spain Declaration and um, the heads of government, the ministers of health, and the university administration took note of this and recognizing the high risk for staff and students, as it turns out, um, asked the Faculty of Medical Sciences, what can we do? And we decided that the first thing to do was to collect the evidence. So we did this risk factor survey in 2010, and we found, for example, that 5% of the female staff were getting the required amount of exercise. And so this evidence, and of course other results, drove us to develop the Healthy Campus Initiative. Now previous to this, the university had always had a health day for staff. In June, when the students are gone home, um, for the summer, they would have this one day and you know, they would, you know, do the health talks and the videos and the posters thing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so um, we, based on the results of the survey, we decided that the one day was not really doing it. So um, first of all, we decided to have a whole health week. So we have different days with different themes, Tasty Tuesday and Wellness Wednesday and Soupy Saturday and that kind of thing. Um, and then we decided to introduce some programs on the ground to actually encourage staff and give them more options to exercise. So there's soca aerobics on a Wednesday evening, that's soca music that you dance to, calypso music. Um, there's line dancing, there's zumba, and we enhance the, um, the staff exercise, uh, uh, um, the, the, the exercise um, place that the staff have. So we started doing these interventions on campus, and just to say something, that the University of the West Indies is, um, uh, serves the English-speaking Caribbean, which is um, uh, about 17 countries, and it has campuses, main campuses, in Jamaica, in Trinidad, and in Barbados. And um, so the effort that started in Barbados, while it's not a network in itself, one of the ideas is to try to export it to the other campuses um, so the other campuses can become more involved. And having just met up back with Hiram, we're going to link up with the Puerto Rican network so that we can actually be part of a network. But right now, we're not part of a network. We're just trying to get it going um, where we are. Um, so we did this health um, survey and intervention in Barbados, and then two years ago, I went to Trinidad 
and did a similar survey among the staff at the St. Augustine campus in Trinidad. Um, and the patterns were actually very similar. Um, there's fairly low rates of smoking, but very high rates of alcohol use. Um, high levels of obesity, low levels of physical activity, um, the diet and physical activity are a real problem, and not only for the staff, but for the students, the society in general, because Kentucky Fried Chicken and Coca-Cola spend a lot of money advertising, <laughs> and the food tastes good. So everybody is encouraged to eat this kind of thing, and, and Trinidad and Barbados are high-income countries. Jamaica is an upper-middle income country, so the people have disposable income, and people are busy, they're not cooking, and you know, you buy Kentucky and take home to your kids. Um, we have a real problem in terms of trying to address the demand for unhealthy food, and I would really be interested in having a discussion around how can we do that, given the billions of dollars that are spent advertising and promoting unhealthy food. Um, we have also been able to influence a little bit, I think, um, some of the other activities in the wider society. So that, for example, um, one of my students uh, last year did a similar risk factor survey in a business place in Barbados. Now, it's interesting because this is an international, um, a transnational company, and they actually had a workplace wellness program that they had gotten from their corporate offices. Now, when my student did his survey, we identified two main problems, high blood pressure and alcohol use. These were not addressed in the generic program that came down from headquarters. So we were able to convince the company to adapt their program that came from headquarters to actually address the priority problems that we had found through our investigation. And I think that's an example of um, the way that universities and student research can actually play directly into workplace wellness programs in the community and have some value um, to what is done. They have called us back now to say they want to repeat the survey a year later because they actually, with our involvement, implemented certain things to reduce. So for example, um, it's an Irish company, I hope I'm not <laughs> being able to, but they, they, the Irish have like a culture of alcohol use, apologies to anybody who is <laughs> and then I'm just saying what they told me. Um, and so one of the things they would do is that every Friday evening, they, the, the managers would lay on some alcohol for the staff. And um, they would also, whenever, whatever the event was, alcohol was there. And so not only were the staff having a good income, able to buy their own alcohol, but they were getting free alcohol at work. So one of the things we did was try to get them not to cut it out, just to reduce it, one bottle instead of three. And we thought that was some progress. So now they want to measure again. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see if the alcohol use has gone down. But those are some of the things that we have been doing and some of the ways we think we have been um, influencing what's happening. And fabulous displays of how initiatives on one campus can actually start to influence regional initiatives in, in campus settings. Thank you very much. Um, next we have Mary Gwendolini who will be translating on our behalf. Would you like a microphone? Yes. But do you want, would you like a chair, actually? Why don't you sit here? Um, so Hiram has been involved in the health promoting universities movement for decades. <laughs> and um, has been working very significantly at national and global scales trying to encourage regional network building, especially in the Latin Americas. Um, and we are interested in how the movement is creating an impact at national and international scales. Thanks so much. Uh, on behalf of the movement of health-promoting university of Ibero-American, 
health promoting university network. Thank so much to Claire and to the organizing committee for this invitation in, and for facilitate the participation of many, many countries and delegates from many countries of Latin America. I invite to all of my colleagues of the Ibero-American Network for Health Promoting University that stand up in the room. Que se levanten todos los representantes de América Latina que están en la conferencia de los países de América Latina. Me gustaría... Muchas gracias por ello. Bueno, eh, eh, the, the movement of health promotion eh, universities in, in, in the Ibero-American region has 15 years on institutional level. We have many indicators of success in, in, in the region, including 15 years of eh, the officialization of the network, six international congress of the REUPS, the, the Network of Health Promotion Universities, five declaratory uh, documents uh, uh, in the region, including La Carta de Edmonton, including the Ciudad Juarez Declaration, including the Pamplona Iruña Declaration, including the San Juan de Puerto Rico declaration and the eh, eh, and summarize obviously the, the declaration of Okanaga. We we another success is the institutionalization of the uh, national uh, uh, network. In many of our countries, including eight countries, has an official network of health promoting university at the national level. In addition, we have another uh, six countries that has the first steps for institutionalization of the network. We have uh, uh, many other indicators of success in the region, including uh, uh, eventos regionales, subregionales, uh, partiendo the recognition that the heterogeneity of the, our countries we have including, in, uh, inclusive the many publications uh, related to the uh, topics of health promoting universities. We have another uh, uh, movement parallel to the, to the uh, health promoting university is the movement of the students, a network of health promoting university at the regional level. And we have another uh, support network parallel network, it's the, the network of SIUPS that includes all of the countries that has official and academic program in the areas of health promotion and health education in the re region, including obviously uh, undergraduate and graduate program. This is a, a particular support group that uh, promote the, the work of health promoting university in the region. Eh, la, experiencia, eh, la experiencia de la red eh, iberoamericana de universidades promotoras de la salud eh, eh, es inmensa. Partimos del reconocimiento que nuestras universidades tienen un rol social y político importante en el campo de la promoción de la salud y, por tanto, eh, 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 corresponde a la masa crítica de salubristas utilizar el potencial de las universidades para impulsar las acciones de promoción de la salud a nivel regional. The experience of the Ibero-American network has been long and based on the recognition that universities have a social and political role in health promotion, especially with regards to the critical mass of public health specialists that are there to uh, promote health in all aspects of university activities. The another point is that the International Organization of Health recognized that the, uh, the work, the cooperative work, the network work, 
in the health promotion field in our region are very important and are, uh, is the component that maintain and sustain the politics of health promotion in the region because the experience is the change in the political approaches in any countries every time. And we, we, we have the university setting with the, uh, the, with the opportunity to maintain the continuous work in the, in the conceptual frame and the conceptual framework and the politics of health promotion at the regional level. This is another point. Eh, otro de los puntos que utilizamos en, en la región iberoamericana pues es el reconocimiento de que el movimiento de universidad promotora de la salud no puede eh, quedarse estacionado en los enfoques preventivistas. Nos parece a nosotros que eh, el, el, el enfoque eh, estacionario de la promoción de la salud en el escenario universitario, pensado exclusivamente desde la perspectiva de servicios asistenciales a los estudiantes y a la población en general eh, eh, universitaria, pudiese ser limitado. Y que ya, tanto en nuestra región como a nivel global, llevamos más de una década eh, eh, de desarrollo de este movimiento y necesitamos movernos a otra dimensión de trabajo. Uh, one other point is the recognition uh, within the health promoting university network uh, that we really can't remain parked in this uh, uh, preventionist focus. Um, if health promotion um, in health promoting universities is, is only considered to be uh, services uh, for students and other university community members, uh, we're convinced that uh, it's a limited view uh, of what really needs to happen. We've been working for more uh, than a decade on, uh, in the region on widening this perspective to include uh, much more, many more elements of health promotion. The another contribution of the Ibero-American movement of health promoting university is the rethinking the conceptual framework of healthy promoting university. We have a, a definition adopted two years ago in the last Latin American Conference on Health Promotion, and we approve a, a new definition included 10 point, 10 components of actions in the field of health promoting university. One of the component is the component, the traditional component of services, but the another nine components are a point related to the uh, life skill in the student, political commitment of the university, environment action, uh, development of leadership, reinforce the, the uh, net network partnership at the institutional level, but outside the university, and including another other activity related to the social determinants of health. Uh, all of uh, activities related to the vinculation with the external community at the university. Um, so it sounds like the Ibero-American network has been really successful and, and possibly its principal achievement is, is the systemic introduction of health promotion at an institutional level. Would you say that? Uh, oh. <laughs> Eh, dirías que el éxito mayor de la, de la red iberoamericana es la introducción de un, de un abordaje más sistémico eh, en las comunidades universitarias. Dirías tú que eso sería eh, el logro principal del movimiento en sus años de existencia. Yo creo que sí. Yo creo que el enfoque sistémico es, eh, ha sido clave en el mantenimiento de las acciones. Y, y, y la, el otro punto es el de la descentralización, es decir, una red regional iberoamericana tiene que utilizar eh, un enfoque de descentralizado y ciertamente el brazo operacional de la red iberoamericana es el trabajo que realizan las redes nacionales que incorporan al sector universitario público y privado en un proyecto realmente nacional y todo ello 
todo ello eh, contribuye al éxito de un movimiento eh, de toda la región iberoamericana. It, I, I definitely think that the systemic approach has been one of our uh, uh, most important achievements. The other aspect uh, or the element of success of our work is the decentralization. Um, it's very important that uh, the work of the national networks is recognized as the real operational arm of the regional uh, network. The work that the national networks are doing both in public and private universities is really the backbone of uh, the regional network, uh, which serves as more of a secretariat. Interesting. So it's maintaining the heterogeneity of these particular national identities as well. Yes. Oh, very fascinating. So I just wanted to, I, I realize we have limited time, and I just wanted to uh, thank, thank all of the panelists for their interesting contributions and ask one skill testing question. Um, but before that, part of this panel is just about introducing you to what is going on globally in terms of health promotion and to encourage you to come and track down these people and pick their brains about their experiences for your own interest or your own interest in developing your own network. Um, so on that note, I just wanted to, to hear from each of you um, the most significant role that networks play in, in promoting health on universities and campuses. Christian. In your view, the most important. So, so you, you think the most, uh, the added value component added. Of, of networking? Well, I think it is uh, the advocacy component because uh, I think one, a university alone cannot advocate for the uh, approach at large. And I think it is very important that uh, health promoting university as networks liaise also with um, developments uh, that are in the educational um, domain in a given country, and that can only be done with, you know, common, common forces. Uh, I guess it's very interesting to look at the network as, as a cooperative role, but it's also we, we sometimes remember the university themselves are competing against each other. So it, it, it would be very interesting if we have a network of healthy university cooperating and then we know what each other are doing and then we share our best practices and then we can bring it back to the management saying, okay, look at the other university, they are doing this and that and why, why are we doing it? We are, we are lagging behind Then maybe we can drive it forward, drive it through the uh, management and hopefully get something going. Thank you. Yes, just to follow up on that last point, what's happening with us at UWI is that Cave Hill started and then um, Trinidad has done their survey and now Mona has had a health day for the first time. So there's a certain amount, as you mentioned, you know, of competition and healthy competition and trying to get it going. The other point I wanted to mention was the involvement of our medical students. Because, you know, the issue with medical students is that they're all about cutting out your appendix and getting you better. That's what they want to do. <laughs> I go to teach public health. They are so not interested in hearing from me, okay? Um, but we involve them in collecting data from their own students. So this, the survey on campus, they did some data collection. And we have also involved them in terms of being our liaison with the Guild of Undergraduates to try to get the students to be doing more physical exercise. The diet thing, we haven't quite gotten there yet because you know that's an issue. But I think the, the, the importance of that is that the medical students are being taught in a practical way what is health promotion. And I think it will do them well for their future careers and what that can do for the region. For me, the, the main role of the uh, network is political. Um, advocate for the health, pro health promotion at the institutional level and the national level. The another point is the capacity building in health promotion and all of the areas related to health promotion. Uh, and the another point is uh, fostering the, the, the network work, work uh, uh, como medida para, para la permanencia de las acciones. Maintain the network como alternativa ante los cambios dramáticos que se dan en las instituciones del sector gubernamental, 
en los países. ¿no? Entonces, eh, el mantener nuestra red de promoción de la salud viva va a ayudar a que, de alguna manera, las, las políticas y las acciones programáticas del ámbito de la promoción de la salud se mantengan. Uh, one, one aspect of, of, of what I mentioned before is that network, uh, networking is a measure to maintain, to keep health promotion alive um, and to ensure that it continues to exist an alternative, as an alternative, uh, especially when faced with huge changes that, um, that happen usually in the region, especially when governments change. The institutionalization of the networks at the institutional level uh, really helps uh, keep health promotion alive uh, when, in the face of uh, what can be a lot of huge political shifts. Fabulous. And I just wanted to integrate the concept of, of sustainability into this, con and into this conversation a little bit too and, and um, advocate for the ways that agendas can be advanced by dovetailing health promotion with sustainability. Yeah, Perfect. I'm Cindy Michelle. I'm uh, from the German uh, Health Promoting University Network and the European Network, which we found in Pamplona. And um, we, yes, we are political now and more and more political, and we don't speak only with the health promoters in the universities. We speak with politicians, we speak with companies, we speak with health insurances, and we speak with a Sustainable University Network, and in Germany we were uh, invited to uh, create the German uh, Sustainability Codex for universities, and the Health Promoting Network is included, and this codex will be released and will be relevant for whole Europe soon in, in, in fall, and I think it's very important after you left the network six years ago, we have become extraordinary political and, this, uh, and say not uh, the, um, the wealth of the members of the universities is important, but the role of the universities for the whole society is important. And we find this in the charter and hopefully we will be able in to, within two years to um, integrate the both networks, health promoting network and sustainable university network at a larger conference in Berlin in order to make more pressure to politicians uh, to, to define, bring this goal into society. And I think it's this political idea, what, what you mentioned with your network, is so important. It's not enough to, to, to um, highlight health promotion within the campus. And Mark and, and the European Network, we did lobbying that the students learn something about health promotion in every single study, not only in the medical studies, as they are so relevant for the, for the development of the uh, future society. And planners and, and architects, and they all have to know something about the, their, their co contribution to, to health and sustainability. And this is what the German network is doing now in, in this time. Fabulous contribution. Well, I'd like to uh, thank the panelists and Sigrid Michelle as well for your contributions. And I, I hope that um, you are accosted by people from here on in.